Assalamu alaikum everyone. Tonight we are in Mefil Ali, formerly a local community hall and the Salam Center of the future. Welcome to Question Time. Assalamu alaikum to all those at home and uh, Assalamu alaikum to our audience here, some of whom weren't even born when Mafil Ali was started. We're fortunate enough to have an exciting panel, all of whom have strong affiliates or affiliations to Mafil Ali. From my right, we have Ahmad Varsi, the editor of the Muslim News, founder of the renowned Muslim News Awards for Excellence and frequently interviewed at The Sky and BBC. Then we have Ali Latif, founder and current chair of the Iraqi Prospect Organization most recently on Newsnight and Huffington Post UK for Iraq 10 years on. And on my left, we have Shalina Jan Muhammad, author of Love in a Headscarf, writer of the, 20, uh, the Spirit 21 blog, and with many articles in national papers, including The Times and The Guardian. Salawat. <laughs> Given our location, the focus of the debate is Islam and the media, what the people here think about it, and what you, the audience, think about it. As always with Mephil debates, whereas we'd normally ask you to switch your phones off, today we're asking you to switch them on and use the Twitter uh, hashtag SICM Sikkim, to tweet your thoughts about the panelists' views. And you'll see their views portrayed on the left and right on the screens. Um, you can use the, uh, the names of the various individuals here, all of whom are on Twitter, at Ahmad Versi, at Ali underscore Latif, and at Love in the Headscarf. And you'll see the Twitter for on the left and right. So without further ado, let's start with our first question from Riyaz Versi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, given what's been happening in Syria, Pakistan, Bahrain, Iraq, Boston, you could go on. We see that uh, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all high profile acts appear to be happening, uh, occurring by Muslims. Should we just uh, grow up and accept that uh, the way that we are being portrayed in the media? Let's start with Ahmed Versi. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Are you saying that um, are different uh, people who are involved in uh, different uh, uprisings uh, in the countries that you've mentioned are uh, termed by the media and others as terrorists or non-terrorists? Is that I, what's exactly what I tried to say? Well, yeah, so that's, that's right, yeah. Yeah, it, it is true. Um, I think generally if you look at uh, the media and uh, the politicians in the West and sometimes in the Muslim world as well, the terms they would use for uh, those who are involved in um, uprisings or liberation, uh, they will term them, term them as terrorists or um, extremists depending on um, who the country is uh, that they are fighting against. And if the countries they are fighting against are sympathetic to the West, then of course, uh, however genuine the uh, uprising is, they will still call them uh, terrorists. Whilst on the other hand, if you have the, um, uh, if I, for example, if I give you an example now, for example, uh, Syria, which is not uh, sympathetic to the West, most of the people who are involved in uh, uprising, even if they are committing atrocities, they still are called um, rebels or um, uh, people who are involved in uprising. Uh, ha they hardly use the word terrorism. Even interestingly, uh, the, uh, um, the Al Qaeda groups who are involved in it, are still uh, you'll find that the term, uh, the terminology is still not. Uh, they have not used as uh, terrorists. Um, the exception is in Bahrain, where uh, the West has been very nuanced in uh, those who are doing the uprising. Because, of course, in uh, Bahrain, uh, the, uh, uh, the opposition has not used any violence means to do the demonstrations. So, uh, m most probably, this is why they have not uh, termed them as terrorists. Uh, if you look at Iraq, um, again, um, it is uh, depending on which media you read they would use uh, the word terrorist or uh, rebels, depending on uh, who, the, or, or who, who are the people who are involved in, uh, uh, in, in violence in Iraq. Uh, and of course, I think you did mention Palestine. Yeah. If the case of Palestine, of course, is quite clear. If uh, the, uh, 
even if uh, most of the uh, those who are taking up arms against Israel are called terrorists in the in the Western media. Uh, even those who are involved against the Palestinian Authority as well in, in the occupied West Bank. So I think it depends on the, uh, who the, uh, uh, the country or the people they are rising up against. Thank you. If anyone has a question from the audience, please raise your hand and we'll uh, get you involved as well. Shalina. Um, your question sounded like it was, um, should we just accept that this is now how we're portrayed? I think if we're being even idealistic, the media is there to give us some kind of insight into the world and help us understand the world better. And if it's not doing that, then we as a community, and I mean by that British people, the world, have a responsibility to make the media a more insightful place. Um, so I think that's the idealist amongst us, that we have that responsibility, whoever is being misportrayed. Um, but from a pragmatic level, there's no longer just this kind of establishment of media. You don't need to go to the Times or the Guardian or the BBC. There's this incredible thing in the last five years called social media. And actually, that's where news happens. And you don't. there are no gatekeepers anymore. If you can be well planned in terms of your Twitter campaign or your Facebook campaign and you get enough traction, that's where the news is happening. So actually, I don't think we should necessarily be the self-victims anymore. We can actually be really clever and we can create the news. Um, but I think that takes a, a different approach and it takes resource and it takes people on the ground. But that's what we should be thinking about now, not getting into the papers. Because if it happens in social media, the papers will report it. Any thoughts from the audience? Ali? Um, to, to answer the question, um, I think up until very recently, most of the uh, news or most of what's been going on in the Middle East has been largely, or Middle East or even the Muslim world, has largely been negative, overwhelmingly negative. Um, and that's not because of the media bias, it's just been negative because the Muslim world's been in turmoil. Um, the one uh, sliver of uh, hope and positivity came out with the Arab Spring. Um, and then again, that was quickly snuffed out uh, with the reverses in Egypt and what's happening in Syria. Let's just face it, um, the Muslim world is in turmoil and the media is just going to reflect that. So the idea that we're being uh, misconstrued or we're being, uh, we're being, you know, the media is being biased against us is actually quite uh, incorrect. I think we make it, uh, we make it difficult for ourselves as uh, Muslims and as the Muslim world itself. Social media, I agree, is an opportunity um, to try and rebalance maybe uh, perceived uh, bias, but that's also got its risks, right? So when Muslims take to social media and uh, if they uh, are not quite media savvy enough, which I've seen many times, uh, they tend to actually score more own goals than actually provide a positive image for Islam. So actually, uh, social media, in a sense, undermines the media establishment in many ways, but actually it's probably also going to cause a lot of problems as well if, we, if people don't take responsibility and uh, use it appropriately. Shalina? Um, I actually have to disagree with your point of we just kind of have to accept that that's how we're going to be portrayed. Because if we look at a lot of the stories around terrorism, there are actually quite significant cases of terrorists who are not Muslim, and they go completely unreported. Um, I mean, the largest stash of explosives found in the UK was with a white ex-BNP member. Didn't hardly made the news at all um, at the same time as some Muslims were found um, planning some targets. So I think... We, we, can, we can input into the media to help shape what our understanding, for example, is of terrorism and who conducts it. If you look at um, government and uh, intergovernment um, statistics, most terrorism acts are conducted by people who are not Muslim. And therefore, just in the sheer interest of you know, good reportage and news, you know, there needs to be a balanced reflection of actually what is happening. And that's aside from, you know, how policy is made and how government should act. But I think just in the sheer instance of news, they need to have a better, more balanced portrayal of it. On that exact point? Uh, yes, OK. So um, I take balance as uh, actually action on the ground. So, I mean, look at the most high-profile things that have happened in the UK that have been Muslim-led over the last few years. 7-7 um, seven, seven bombings, um, you know, burning of poppies where British soldiers are coming back f uh, dead, you know, from Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, you've had lots of different big, big high-profile sort of 
Muslim-led activity. We can discuss how Muslim it is or not. But my point is, what's, what's the positive? What positive actions has the Muslim community in the UK actually done for this country over the past you know, 20, 30 years? But what, what single act can, you know, is quite present in people's mind that balances these high-profile actions? How can you compete with Maybe. bombing the underground, right? You need to do something really spectacularly positive to rebalance it. Another way of looking at it is, forget the spectacular, how about Muslims start integrating a bit more in this country? You know, the man on the street, he goes, oh, actually, I know a Muslim, and they're not all terrorists, but we don't interact, we don't integrate, we don't know hardly anyone in this country. You know, we, in our little ghettos, in our little cocoons, and then we complain about the media bias. Of course, because they don't know us. We're an unknown. Uh, you can see how much uh, he's been influenced by the media, because... <laughs> Uh, the whole point is, the reason is that because the media does not want to uh, report the positive uh, stories. So therefore, you see all the negativities out there. And, and this, is the, this is the whole, the whole uh, issue. And if you can look at all the statistics of the surveys that have been done, most of the people in this country uh, are influenced by the media, how the media does the reporting. So this is how they understand the communities. <clears throat> and if you look at, uh, you, you take at any, uh, any stories, even when something Muslim uh, have done positive, they'll try and make it uh, very nuancedly uh, uh, negative. So for instance, if you look at um, in Birmingham, when the uh, three Muslims were uh, killed in, in, uh, uh, during the riots, uh, deliberately killed, and uh, one, the father of one of them uh, was very good in the, the way he uh, controlled uh, the Muslim crowd to tell them not to respond negatively and uh, aggressively. Uh, he had positive uh, coverage in the media but cleverly, the media did not mention his religion. They said he was an Asian, even though he was a Muslim. And he did mention that it was his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, the influence of Islam that made him uh, do what he did. So they did not mention that at all. Yeah? If he had committed a crime, right, they would have said he's, he's Muslim. And, and I have done surveys of, uh, if you look at any media, uh, you'll have, uh, if a person who's not a Muslim commits a cr criminal act, any. Uh, not terrorism, they'll just mention him by name or by, uh, not even by color. But if it is a Muslim father, say, involved with the uh, killing of kids or whatever, they'll say Muslim men. This is, this is in the headlines in, uh, across the board. And I think positive stories are there, are there, but it's the media, he, uh, the media does not want to uh, ha um, uh, portray us in a, in a positive manner. And talking about integration, the Muslims are one of the most integrated community in this country, ghettos. There are more ghettos, uh, for example, if you, if you look at other communities, you go to Chinatown, you'll know where the ghetto is. You go to Northwest London, you'll see the, there's also a, a Jewish community there in the ghetto. You go to Leicester, there's Hindu ghettos. I mean, you could go to Southall, the Sikh ghettos. I mean, those kind of things are, happening, are, are there, but Muslims are trying to integrate to go into outside the communities, and if you look at it, uh, across the country, you'll find Muslims are almost everywhere, and they are... For example, even in the political field, integration means you're integrating in all sides of uh, all areas of life. And so if you look in politics, Muslims are more integrated into politi political, political field than any other ethnic communities. You'll see, if you look at counselors, uh, there are uh, more Muslim counselors than uh, in any other faith counselors in this country. I mean, other than the Christians or white, uh, white if you look at uh, color. So, I mean, the, the, there's integration there. But it's just the way the media is not portraying it. See, the, the, the media doesn't want to portray it. Uh, so therefore, when people read and watch, they find it's all negative, and they feel and they believe that Muslims are actually not contributing anything to this society. Are there any voices from the audience which we can try and bring in? Yeah, just there, one sec. The lady with the scarf, the black scarf in the second row. Uh, I would totally agree with Ahmed Versi because I have noticed myself that if a teacher is criticizing slightly in his classroom about uh, uh, gay marriages, for example, he is banned from teaching. If we say one word against Israel or against even Holocaust, we can be put into prison. Am I right? But if three top journalists can write big articles, whether they're atheists or Christians, I don't care about that. But what is worrying, and he's pointing it right, that we can see that printed in media that Islam is a terrorist country, a terrorist, terrorist religion, 
Islam teaches terrorism and barbarism, and Islam is a horrible, uh, demon-like religion. These are the words that came in Independent and in Times, both in, in Independent and Guardian, both. Now, we know that, that it's not now, it's not from now on. This hatred has been implanted from the time of Crusaders, and it is continuing to do so. What we have to do is we cannot fight the media here as it is, but we have to try and find out how can we become more eloquent, how can we impress our say by actions and by writing and by pen and by lobbying and by radio. Now, I try to make two calls to radio. 50 pence it cost me each time, and I didn't get the slot. Now, they didn't even know my name. So how can you help us, the panel, I would request the panel, how can you help us in portraying that balance talk that we have just had, the balanced approach so that the media can not uh, bombard the Muslims unnecessarily and can bring the truth home. Thank you. Thanks. We'll, we'll look at the, the media and how we can use the media in a better way later on in the, in, in the show. Um, let's can to get some more views from the audience if we can. Um, the lady on the left-hand side at the end. Perhaps there's something to be said about how we express ourselves as Muslims. And I think if we express ourselves in the, in the right way and in a kind of non-emotional way, I think there is a lot that can be said. And there are kind of political commentators like Mahdi Hassan that do disagree with kind of prevalent opinions. So I think there is potentially something to be said about how we express ourselves. Um, and perhaps taking a more kind of broad stance um, on injustice in the world. I mean, I think people perceive Muslims as kind of very one-track. They're only concerned about Israel and Palestine, Iraq, you know, as Shias were concerned about Bahrain, but what about ever, like other places in which people are, you know, suffering or um, subjugated by their, um, by their governments? So I think if we want um, our image to change or to shift, I think there needs to be a positive effort on our part, and we need to start considering, our, considering the wider community as well as ourselves, um, because we can't expect other people to portray us positively if we don't, we aren't really concerned about them either. So I think we need to first express ourselves in a way that's non-emotional and articulate, and secondly, to take a broader stance on kind of glo on global issues um, and not just issues that affect ourselves. Any comments from the panel, sir? I totally agree with that. Um, the point is, um, yeah, we are very biased towards Muslim-only uh, conflicts and injustice, and I agree that it reflects badly on us. On a positive, more positive note, I think, um, you know, as m the UK Muslims establish themselves a bit more, I think we are starting to care a bit more about local issues, UK issues as well as sort of broader issues. Um, even if you look at where our charity is going, a lot more charities actually staying in the UK and there's a lot more charitable organizations that not just look out for Muslims, look out for the wider community as well. You know, you, you, we, you know just here we're, we're involved in a food bank that's going to help the local community here. That's the sort of action that's going to prove give us some positive image rather than, I uh, said, you know, just uh, keeping to ourselves and then uh, blaming the me media for bias. I think it's positive action that speaks louder than words. I think, um, you see, that even if you're doing, I mean, there are Muslims who are speaking out against other injustices. It's just that it, it, you don't get into the media for that because they will, they will not talk, talk to you. Many, many times I've been in the media and if I start talking about issues other than Muslim men, I'm being interviewed and I think, and they'll say, why didn't you not do that before? I said, but you've never invited me to speak on that issue when uh, it happens, right? So you have to be invited. Even if you do a press release and sending them out, uh, you might not get, you know, necessarily get it. So for ex instance, uh, 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 this is a quite, um, quite an old example and could be kind of a different kind of an example. So for instance, when uh, the revolution took place in Iran, uh, uh, Khomeini talked about uh, 
all kinds of injustices in the world. He just did not focus on Muslims. So uh, and the, what, at that time, it was apartheid in South Africa against, and he supported the ANC and the opposition. You had the same thing in, in South America and elsewhere. And he uh, and, and Iran got a very negative image in the media. But, you know, he was supporting those causes which the West was supporting. Uh, the countries of those causes. I so therefore the West was supporting the apartheid regime in South Africa, and so and the Americans were supporting the other extreme regimes in in, in South America and so on. So I mean, even if you take up a key issues, the broader issues, it depends again on what are the geopolitics uh, that we are talking about. If it is uh, to the negative or, or to the against the um, establishment or the uh, the Western policies in in the region, then I think it it, it makes a change. But Muslims are speaking out against other issues, and the, the, the food bank we are talking about now has been there for the last almost 15, 20 years. Muslims have been going around in the, um, uh, in the city and elsewhere, is, uh, supporting, uh, uh, you know, going, and working the poor, and also working on domestic issues, because uh, we have been involved on issues of domestic, domestic issues for a long time. For instance, if you take one uh, interfaith example, like in uh, some 15, um, 20, to 20, 2001, I think, when we wanted to have religion in the question of census, you had the Muslim community uh, working together with the Jewish and Christian and other communities together, and this is going back a long time ago, to work together to, to bring about the change, and it did succeed. And there are many such examples that has taken place for more than 20 years. Uh, Muslims getting involved in the domestic affairs with other communities, and not, and not just Muslim issues. Shreena. I think... Um I take a different approach to your question, which is that um, the vision that I have, and I think a lot of people share who work in the public space, is that one day, wouldn't it be great to switch on the TV and the expert that you're looking at, whether it's, I don't know, gardening or cookery or childcare or economics, is an expert in their field and, by the way, happens to be a Muslim. Um, I think that, to me, will be the ultimate state to know that we've reached a point of success um, and that Muslims are seen as everybody else. But to do that, we need to be experts. We need to be experts in many things. Um, and I think that's really the greatest achievement that we can have. Now, in the interim, sadly, we still need to be working hard to change the perception that the media and the public has of us. So that means, by default, we have to be working in this space and starting to create room for other voices. But ultimately, I think you know, this is a short-term measure. Long-term, what we want is for everybody in this room to be an expert in something and just happen to be Muslim when they talk in the space. So that, that's the vision I think we should be going for. Yes, and views from the audience? Mizar, um, from the first one. Uh, that there is uh, a bias uh, against uh, Muslims as far as depiction of uh, any any news item or whatever it may be. So my next question is, what is fundamentally the reason behind that? I mean, how paranoid, how how paranoid uh, do we have to be to try and understand? The lady did try and allude to the fact that. It is from the crusade period that that has remained. Um, I, I find it hard to believe that all these generations, the young British individuals today, for whom crusades is history long gone by, would be influenced up to today. I and mean, you, you yourself remarked that Ali has changed just one generation. Um, so you can see that it is impossible for generations that dogma, that belief, that hatred to remain decades later or centuries later. So, that, that I, so, so my, my fundamental question is, if you're right, why? What is it? W what's wrong about Muslims? What have Muslims done? Why, why are those individuals powerful in the media uh, bashing Muslims? I don't know why they're past. It's easier to ask them. Just two things. I mean, Karen Armstrong has written a book as well, and, and she argues the case that it is in the, still the, in the subconscious of the European mind about these crusades and others. And even if you look at the education, it's very Eurocentric oriented. Um, there is hardly anything that talks about positive contributions to these, like uh, European civilization by the Islamic civilization or a Muslim civilization, which is the case. 
I mean, today I was with um, Boris Johnson this morning, and he was saying, um, emphasizing on that. I said, so why don't you ask Michael Gove, because there's a, just now a discussion on to have this, um, uh, the national curriculum, why don't you ask him to change the national curriculum and, and include uh, more broader curriculum so that when from young age people come to know that Muslims have done a huge amount of cont positive contributions to the society and influence the civilization as well, European civilization, and as we know today, uh, as we know now, that can change a lot. But you see, from a young age, they grow up in thinking that I, t I take Madesa here. Uh, and I found when I asked them questions, because we have a current affairs issue, uh, uh, programs, and they come from different schools. And in, in those schools, they, they, these are between 12 and 14 year old, uh, years old. And they're telling me they have huge problems in schools. The other young kids using such kind of terminology, terrorism, extremism, and you know, really uh, uh, giving them huge problems and they cannot do anything. And this is young, these are young kids. You know, I do not know it is education, it is the influence at home from the parents by watching TV. I don't know what the issue is. I will illustrate with one example. I cannot understand logically why this is happening. See, BBC Asia Network, okay? Uh, uh, theoretically, they should, it's, it's, for, it's an inclusive BBC for all communities. Uh, there was a survey done by the BBC, and it was uh, uh, the BBC Asian Network. They, were, they did a survey to find out how British were Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims, yeah, the, the comparison. So the headline was, uh, British, British Asian feel less British than the whites, right? And you know what photograph they had? A woman in a cob with a baby. Yeah, this is Muslim. So we did some investigation, and I think uh, also uh, Inayat Banglawala also was, uh, did it as well. And it, it, we found, and when, because then we went into details to read the actual survey. And when we went to survey, and we found, we found out that uh, Muslims, Muslim Asians, feel more British than the Hindu Asians, and the Sikhs feel more British than both the Muslim the Hindu, uh, and the Hindus. So if the way, and they, didn't, they, had, they had not mentioned this, by the way, in the news. Then after this came out, then we know uh, MCB and uh, we also, uh, we had done a story as well. So they changed it. They removed the photograph and they didn't, they didn't uh, replace it with any other photograph. And then they gave more details, okay? So you could see their own survey, this, you know, it, it showed that Muslims were more British than the Hindus. Well, so why didn't they have a picture of a Hindu or a temple? Why did they have it of a Muslim? I mean, you try, and, I mean, I cannot understand it. I mean, you, you, know, you, should, you, know, you try and find out. Okay, uh, what, first row on your lips. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I, ha I have a question about, the, you know, along the same lines of why and how. Um, we, we tend to place the media into one big cloud, and um, at the end of the day, they're individuals, there's journalists, producers, editors, they all make decisions, and so is the fault lying with these decision makers or is it just j lazy journalism because journalists are known to be really lazy and I actually spoke to one who said to me well you know we don't have any Muslims writing so if you were the first person to write about anything to do with Muslims you know you would be the point person on that topic so maybe maybe it's just laziness and the fact that you know 7-7 happened 9-11 happened you know, we got stuck with this label, and as a result, we're still dealing with the ramifications of it now. Okay, um, just a few things. Um, to answer your question, I think there's two big things, I think. Um, firstly, Muslim immigration to Europe is quite a recent thing. I mean, mass migration to Europe has been quite a recent thing, and I think that's got... With any sort of migration, there's always this uh, um, sort of fear of the other, fear of an unknown culture. Um, and secondly, it's the political situation in the Middle East that reflects back, and you've got this terrorism. And I think those two major things have created this fear of the other that the media does play upon. Um, and, um, and that's my point. If they don't know us, they will fear us. So um, my point is we need to be a bit better known uh, in the UK. The other point about um, lazy journalism, I totally agree. I remember when, um, when Saddam Hussein was executed, um, the BBC, Sky, everyone had all these experts on 
who were these Arab experts who didn't really have a, much of a clue about Iraq. No Iraqis were on speaking about Saddam Hussein's execution at all. Now, I take that as a failure of Iraqis because they were not made known to, made, made themselves known to those channels. And actually, me and my friends got together and actually called all the channels and said, by the way, why have you got these clowns on your TV? Why don't you ask if you speak to an Iraqi? And immediately they said, fine, come on. And we all came on. We came on and we, we, the, the whole day we were on like BBC, Sky, all the other channels. And just because they didn't know any Iraqis. You have to be make, we have to make ourselves available. We have to be a bit more organized. And I think it's not a media conspiracy. It's just the fact that we're just not very engaged, either in the media or even in the country itself. The man at the, flat, the end of the, in the, in the white shirt. Um, I think it's, uh, it is an interesting and uh, quite complicated debate. I just want to give you two or three actual uh, discussions we have had, yeah? So, it, the, I think it's just uh, before or after 9-11, I'm not sure now, we had a discussion with most of the newspaper editors here about the coverage of Muslim issues, right? And Muslims. And I remember very clearly we went to the editor of the Times, Peter Stoddart at that time. And he said, look, uh, at the end of the day, you must remember that the Crusades was not that long ago and we are absolutely influenced by that and our image of Muslims is totally conditioned by that. This is the editor of the Times. It's not a person on the street. And this comes through into the curriculum in history and everything else, right? If you look at the kind of history they want to teach, apart from a coverage of the Holocaust, which is one main thing. Everything else is in a narrative which is totally, obli I mean, oblivious of Muslim issues. Now, f for the first time, we had a big discussion on multiculturalism coming in. At the base of multiculturalism is to accept a multi-value environment, right? Which means there could be values which could be equally valued, right? Which means you cannot say this is superior to that. Now, for that to happen, obviously, a lot of concessions have to be made by a dominant community. And part of the language of anti-multiculturalism from Cameroon and uh, Merkel and so on is this, that this is challenging our own sense of superiority as white British people, okay? Third thing to understand in this debate is that a society always tries to find a scapegoat. So here, of course, before it was the Jews who then went out of it, and then it came for the black people and, the and racism. And now it's Muslims, okay? The last point is that when the Soviet Union showed signs of collapse after the coming of Yeltsin and so on, there was a question in uh, NATO as to what is the purpose of NATO now, now that the main challenge to NATO is gone. So the first speech by the Secretary General of NATO, and this is before 9-11 or anything else, he said that we need to find and situate a new enemy in Muslims for us to be able to justify our military budgets. So there are deeper issues here than which appears on the surface. And the anti-Islam rather than anti-Muslim, right, sentiment. The other thing we need to do is that see that what is happening in the Middle East or in Asia or other places is not of great concern to these people. 
their only concern is that if the abuses which are happening there by the people themselves and by them in terms of things like, you know, the drones and whatever else, if they become too obvious, then their own values are compromised. As far as Muslims here are concerned, for them this is a different question. By demonizing them, I think the idea is to deny them their proportional right in society. Because if we get proportional right in society, we would be holding balance of power in this country. And that is the point. Let's get a few more uh, Sorry, let's go. Let's go. Um, I mean, it, it's hard not to feel heavy hearted after you listen to that kind of commentary. Um, but I think maybe what it's worth unpacking for people who are a bit less familiar with the media that actually there's many different things that the media achieves. Um, one of them is this kind of very high level, in my view, policy and political narrative that goes on. Um, but from my perspective, for example, the, the kind of writing that I do for the media is actually aimed at what is just ordinary people. So m my feeling for my writing, for example, is that I just want ordinary people to read it and go, you know what, that, that Muslim woman, she sounds okay. Or, you know, I kind of understand. And what makes me happiest when I write is when people write in and they say, I'm not Muslim, I'd never thought about it like that. And that, for me, is enough. That's, that's all I can hope for, that at a, a kind of ordinary person-to-person -person level, that that use of the media has had an impact. So I think there are people like Ahmed Barisi's work, like this high-level political influence that we want to get that's important to get into the narrative. But I don't think we should forget uh, the power <coughs> of just talking to other people <coughs> and the, awa the way that that kind of one-to-many model of the media that it has can, can have on other people. Uh, can I also talk about this lazy journalism? Um, it is true, but also uh, you have to understand they have uh, policies uh, of all the newspapers. So they have sub-editors. Uh, if you're a, c a commentator, it's different, but when you're a new, uh, journalist, uh, the uh, sub-editors, they normally will change your, st they might even change your story to conform. I'll give you an example. Arifa Akbar, she'd come here for, um, his, she writes for The Independent now, and the cultural, I think she's a cultural leader, editor or something. She, I mean, for example, we had a um, um, media training here, and she gave an example that when she was still junior, because now she's senior, so you know, uh, uh, they might not be able to do it. Uh, and she went to interview Abu Qatada, the other the person is in the news, and she used herself as a Muslim, and she, to, you know, she, she told him, "I'm a Muslim. I want to come and interview you." So you know, he and she got an exclusive with him. So she did an interview and she did a story. So she, then she rang her off, um, her, her, uh, the newspaper, the Independent, to write, the, give the story. And uh, the next day she reads it, it was different from what she had given. I mean, that, that changed uh, so some parts of it. And of course she said, well, now they'll never, uh, they'll never do it, dare do it for me. But you could see what happens. You see, you, 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 um, as a, a journalist, it's not, only, it's not necessarily just, I mean, there's lazy journalism from the journalist's point of view. But there's also sub-editors and those people who are involved. They have, I mean, there are policies, you know, how we should be going, like Iqbal said, and also I was in one of the meetings, one of the editors uh, said that, you know, when we said, how come your policy is so pro-Israel bias? Okay, well, you have to accept that. This is, you know, um, uh, we have, you know, this is our view and our angle, and we have to, uh, we, we will do that. You know, they don't, it's nothing to do with um, uh, concern about humanity or concern about you know, Palestinians' plight. It, it, is, it is a policy, and that's it. So there are policies, but by the way, ordinary journalists are quite good people. I mean, I'm not uh, denying that. But you can be a journalist and then write a story and it can change. Okay, let's get um, some tw uh, news from the tweets and then we'll get uh, another view from the audience. Okay, we've had uh, a few tweets. Um, we had one from G Machine. This is a question for the panel. Uh, why does the media seek the views of people like Anjum Chowdhury? Um, we had uh, Riaz Ismail saying, Muslims need to get over their victim mentality and think positively about their contribution to society. So I'm sure that the panelists will have a lot to say about that. Migdal Verisi, our, our chair, said, do we complain too much? Um, Kumail Verisi also is asking, he's saying, we've got a long way to go to integrate instead of living in ghettos, and it's not easy if Muslims are, I think that's portrayed as terrorists. So that's a few tweets. And we have another one from Poor Muslim who says, how can you integrate when you look different? <laughs> so I'll let the panel decide. Let's get, a, let's get some more views from the audience. Uh, the lady at the back of no, with the white scarf. Uh, 
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I was just going to mention something that I didn't hear, hear it here, um, but I'm sure all of us know. Uh, one point is the uh, idea of khilafah that is in Sunni and the khilafat of uh, Imam Mahdi, which is in Shia. I think that is one thing that is scared, they are scared of and they probably are working against that, uh, against Islam, in fact, because of that idea. Uh, though the Israeli people have the same sort of idea, some kind of different, uh, and American have uh, another kind of idea about having you know, the same culture all over the world. So these are all other views. And um, the other thing is that uh, all the, um, as we all know, all the oil energy sources are concentrated in most uh, Islamic countries. So what they really want is um, to have power over them. Uh, they, don't should, they shouldn't have their own you know, votes and their own uh, ideas. Um, Probably these are the main point things behind everything, but still we haven't, we shouldn't be disappointed to not to work or not to try to integrate, to change, to communicate with other people. Thank you. And uh, come to you in a second, and the lady on the left hand side. There seems to be quite a lot of comments about um, kind of, there, is, there does seem to be an agenda. Um, an anti-Islam or anti-Muslim agenda um, and kind of real politics kind of playing out. Um, do you think we just need to be smarter about it in the sense that no one likes a victim and we may be victims, um, we may not be victims, but maybe we just need to stop talking about it and maybe as Shanina says, um, kind of show people what Muslims are really about and kind of make positive contributions. So maybe the smart thing to do is just to stop talking about what's out there against us. What do you think about that? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, if we, um, if we buy into the narrative of them and us, then what's the point, right? We should just pack up and leave Europe, right? I mean, seriously, what are we doing here, right? I mean, so that's the point, right? So first of all, we shouldn't give in to that narrative. We are British, we are European, and we're not working for them some sort of massive conspiracy, and they're not, they haven't got a consp massive conspiracy against us. There's geopolitics, obviously, there's policy, there's, there's internal politics, there's external politics, and that's fine, and sometimes we are, fall on the either side or the wrong side, but that's okay. We, we do need to be positive, but really, I, I keep stressing this, Really, we really need to think about our future in Europe, in this country. How do we become positive representatives of our religion, of our communities? How do we actually undermine this you know, anti-Islamic uh, narrative, which I think is not as strong as people make out? Um, and that's where we should just, and I totally agree, we should just go on with it, to be honest. Sorry, how can you, um, this is a point, um, you see, to be able to change that, the media has to be, uh, we live in the age of media. So that has to change. Otherwise, uh, the public is heavily influenced by that. Um, as the, the issue of Anjam Chaudhary uh, and so on, I'll give you an example. At the anniversary of, the first anniversary of 9-11, when Muslims around the country were praying for the victims and the families of, the, um, uh, of those in the United States who were, uh, who were killed by the terrorists, uh, you had uh, BBC. Uh, of course, the narrative was Muslims around the country are praying for this, and the images they showed were the uh, the of the uh, Anjam Chaudhary and then their group, like celebrating and so on. So you could see. So if you are an ordinary person, you see, um, um, Ruhi works in t TV. She knows very uh, very well. Images are very important. You might hear things, right? But it doesn't go into you as much as the images. So that sh then you see the images you see, ah, oh, this is what the Muslims are doing. And the BBC is so clever of doing that. And it's not unique in that time. For example, currently, there, were, uh, there was a story of uh, the Asians in the northern towns where they um, had committed this uh, um, crime of uh, grooming young, young women. Um, so they were talking about the story, and what was the image being shown by the BBC? Mosque. Yeah? So what is mosque? to do with grooming of children. You can, see the, you can see the way they play, 
Okay? Why? There's no logic behind it. So you could see, uh, I mean, it, it is very, very important. You know, this, uh, we have to try and change. And as Iqbal mentioned, see, even this is before 9-11, the Muslim community, especially the Muslim Council of Britain, they have had so many meetings because uh, Islamophobia was before then as well. They had so many meetings with almost every section of the media, broadcasting, editors, sub-editors, they had it with uh, editors of newspapers, journalists, to try and change this perception. Yeah, but as you can see, that they, uh, they did succeed to some extent, but not, not as much. Can we get some, let's get some views from the audience and come back straight back to Shalina. Um, let's start with the lady in the back row with the black scarf, and then we'll come to the middle. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking, and I agree with Ali, I think, yes, 9-11, the West needing an enemy. But I think we generally tend to kind of say, well, it's the media. What are we doing when it comes to integrating, educating our children, being experts, as Shalina said? Unfortunately, if you look at the um, Bangladeshi community in the East End and their achievements, um, girls are not allowed to go to school, parents don't send their girls to school and take them away to Pakistan. There is a lot of things that we can do ourselves. The media is an entity that we have to change ourselves. And to do that, we have to educate ourselves and integrate, not insular, go to mosque and that's it. We need to embrace everybody, not just be a Shia or a Sunni or whatever you want to be. You have to be a Muslim and also a human being. And I think it's all too easy to say it's the media, it's the media. The men in up north were all Muslims. It's a sad indictment. Yeah, but, so the, but, but, the, that, but the majority, 95% of, of grooming is done by whites. Did they show you churches? I agree. I did they go, totally, and go to the church I and, totally uh, and, and do that? Did the BBC so show you churches? Going, so what did we do to redress that issue? What did we do? Nothing. No, a lot has been done. You have to, that, that's what I'm saying. We need to educate ourselves to get in the media. If we want to change that, we have to get ourselves in powers of position, just like the Jews did. Let's get some more views from the audience. Um, the lady in, with the red scarf in the middle. I agree that there is a bias to some extent in the media, but there isn't any smoke without fire. And I think, as the brother was saying, there is the Middle East, the Muslims in, in the East are messed up to a very big degree. <laughs> and no matter what, no matter how much we integrate in the West, no matter what good we do, we'll always be seen as the fluffy Muslims of the West. And the real Muslims and the real Islam is in the East and it's the terrorist Islam. So I think before integrating, we also need to go out and criticize the Muslims and make it clear, instead of taking the defensive attitude whenever there's something reported about child brides, go out and say, yes, Muslims are the first people to say that this is disgusting, this is completely against religion. We need to start criticizing the East before not just integrating here, because no matter how much we integrate here, there's only so much we can achieve if we don't denounce the actions in the East. Selena. What? I actually am starting to feel quite worried hearing this um, string of comments. Um, and my worry is, I, I think there is some elements of truth, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But what worries me is this overwhelming sense of um, misplaced guilt that I think Muslims take on their shoulders. We're not responsible for everything that happens in the world, and there is only so much that each one of us can do. Now, it's important that each of us does what we can do, but, um, you know, there was a great piece written after the, the Boston Marathon bombings by um, a prominent Muslim American where he says, you know, here are eight reasons why I am not responsible for what happened after the Boston Marathon. And I think while it's important that, you know, we take responsibility w and as in our part in society, it is important that we speak out when we see Muslims that are doing things that are incorrect. Equally, um, to me, it just, it just is a circular into the, the media narrative that we're talking about. If we say that, sorry, not in my name for everything, you know, you just can't, I, my view is you just can't do it. Um, you do as much as you can. Um, you condemn where it's appropriate, but we don't, we're not responsible for 9-11. We're not responsible for July the 7th. We're not responsible for Boston. So, you know, let's, let's be positive. Let's not kind of take the guilt and play the victim. I just don't think we should do that. Ali, do you have any view on that? Probably. 
<laughs> no, actually, I actually do agree. We, uh, um, my, most of those points are, are correct. Um, we shouldn't, you know, there is, there is, yes, yeah, sometimes the, the, um, you know, sometimes we do take a bit of guilt uh, where it's not really uh, where we where we shouldn't really. Um, but my point is is exactly your point. To be honest, let's just get on with our lives. But if but, you know, if we, we if we define ourselves as Muslims and only Muslims, and we get caught up and we only concern ourselves with Muslim issues, then hey, you know, if something happens to Muslims or Islam, we'll get labeled, right? That's what I'm saying. We need to diversify, say actually we are human beings, we are obviously Muslims, but we do care about other things, and we aren't going to be pinned, you know, any, any Islamic issue is not just going to be relevant to us, it's going to be relevant to everyone, and I think that's how we, that's how we can get past this it's just you know it works both ways that's what i'm just trying to say um you know i, I don't understand why we say muslims in the east are messed up i don't think so. <laughs> I think it's the wrong attitude i mean who invaded afghanistan yeah and we created all these things who invaded iraq yeah who's been doing all these things okay who are involved who have been propping up all the um, dictators in the east are they muslims yeah the muslims are being oppressed there it is the Western uh, power that is being propping them up. So it, of course they'd be messed up if, if this is the way you've been treating them. Um, no one talks about the, um, uh, uh, the, the question of Israel. I mean, how is it that we don't get this negative image as much as uh, Muslims are getting? Who's been occupying all the lands in, 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 in the East? Yeah? Uh, who is involved in all these things? We, we don't uh, um, talk about it. This one example, it's quite interesting. Uh, at the end of, I think it's 50th anniversary of the creation of the State of Israel, or, uh, I think it was 50 or something, well, one of the anniversaries, for the first time ever, the highest number of uh, British Jews had come to Trafalgar Square to celebrate. Now, what did we see there? There were British Jews carrying Israeli flags. There were a few British flags, but the majority had Israeli flags. Okay? And we had uh, our uh, uh, Secretary of State and Shadow Secretary of State, we had Michael Ankrum from the Conservative Party, who was a shadow. We had uh, Mendelssohn, uh, who was from, from the government. They were there, they were praising and supporting this event. When Muslims carry other flags, say Iranian flags, and go and celebrate, well, this, the, 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 where are your loyalties? Yeah? No one challenged the loyalties of the British Jews there. Okay, and when there was a cricket, you know, whenever there's a cricket between England and, and uh, for India, the a majority of the Hindus here they support India from India support India. Oh, sorry, they support India, and no one says anything. When Pakistanis do it, we had uh, we always get criticism that you know you are not British enough. And and one of the con as you know, uh, one of the criterion to be British is the the cricket uh, test, right? Who you support the cricket? Test too. No, have a responsibility to change that image and perception. How, how can and you I know do it's it when we don't have space to do it? I mean, but you see, you can write comment pieces. It doesn't make any difference. You see, the amount of time, the amount of time that is spent on the media, yeah, I mean, if you could uh, broadcasting and print media, uh, uh, which is very, very uh, against Islam, um, Muslims mainly, yeah, I mean, the Muslim countries, is is huge compared to positive stories like what Shalina and others write. It's a very small number. I know it's a small number, but if you look at it, even if you look in the Middle East at the moment, they're all fighting. And it's because there isn't Who's that... I know they're creating it, but at the end of the day, it all falls down to us as individuals, and it's a bigger picture, just, isn't it? Can I just clear up a point? If we're going to go back in history, yeah, who messed up the Islamic world? It was us, okay? We became weak, we got colonized, and we become the playthings of the rest of the world, okay? So it started from us because the world's about power, all right? So let's not tell this nonsense that we're always colonized and we're always, always, always not our fault, it's not our fault. It was our fault. We were leading the world at some point in time. We became decrepit and corrupt, and that's how we lost. It, all right, so let's clear that Agreed. one up. I agree right. with you. We need to get back up on our feet as, as opposed to sit, sitting down and saying, oh, poor us. We're not poor us anymore. We need to speak up and say, look, this is what we are. Let's, uh, let's take some more comments. One from the uh, final row. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, if we bring the debate to, to some more practical issues, uh, in addition to what... Uh, our sister Mariam has said about uh, Khilafah. I think that issue which excites the media here the most is this question of Sharia. Every time they find, they say Muslims want to apply Sharia law. 
So I, I just want to hear from the panel what do they think uh, has to be, you know, a kind of uh, approach to this issue. It, it, it's, it's a very sensitive issue, right? I mean, to the ordinary person, imposition of a foreign law in your own country, that's not really, you know, that's not really, that's not really transparent, that's not democratic, you know? Who, 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 who sets these laws, yeah? Okay, this is actually quite a scary concept, right? And, you know, you throw it around, you know, and Muslims on TV, you know, we want Sharia law in the UK. What does that mean? You know, if I was, if I was a non I, as a Muslim, I'm actually scared of that too, to be honest. Um, so the issue is, obviously, in reality, it's not the case. In reality, there are some certain, you know, family law and certain, certain uh, cases where Sharia Muslims would like to, 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 to take their cases on, in front of a Sharia law. Okay, in that context, it doesn't sound so bad. However, it's still, it's, there are, it's problematic, okay? And I don't think... We've got a solution to it yet. I don't think at the moment, you know, a parallel court system is, is ideal. And secondly, you know, it's, it's such good fodder for the newspapers. I mean, seriously, uh, unless we get a solution for it first, let's not talk about it, okay? Seriously, it's not a goer until we figure it out. Otherwise, you know, as I said, it, it actually undermines the British system, legal system. And seriously, we need to really think about how we actually portray this very idea. Very quickly. Yeah, but actually, um, uh, excuse me, this is nothing to do with, I mean, Muslims saying that. It, it is like uh, just now, it is going to the House of Lords, the bill uh, by Baronax Cox, uh, who is very, known, uh, very well known for her um, uh, anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic. This is uh, this perception uh, regarding that. Uh, talking about with Sharia courts, there's no Sharia court in this country. Uh, these, these are uh, the councils, uh, the Sharia council are, are the same as the Bethlehem, which are the Jewish ones. No one demonizes the, the Jewish community by using that term and say, look, how dare you have your best things. In fact, um, uh, they're they are being supported. So, I mean, it's, just, it's exactly the similar kind of a thing. But it's the way the media is portraying it. And so that the perception like um, uh, Ali you know, gets frightened because of that. But, I mean, this is the whole point. It is, it, what Muslims are doing is quite innocent. But it's the way uh, the media is playing with that game. It doesn't do that with the Jewish community, for example. Why doesn't it do it? We're just more established than we are. Anyway. Um, I think what's interesting about the word Sharia is that it tends to mean something quite different to Muslims to what it means to people who are not Muslim. Um, so if we look at a num lots of studies that try and poll what do Muslims want about Sharia, the headlines you get are really scary things like 9 million percent of Muslims want to have Sharia law in the country. Um, and actually, when you dig deeper, what appears to be coming out is Muslims are saying that they want to live their own lives according to the laws that they see prescribed in the Quran. And um, one, my actual job, rather than working, uh, writing for the media, is uh, to run a branding agency for Muslim consumers. And in the research that we did, we found that most Muslims want to live by Sharia which basically to them means the code of life. It's how you pray and eat and how you visit people and all the things that we take for granted. So I think there is some work to be done and, and how it's done needs to be explored, but some work to disentangle these kind of crossed perceptions of what Sharia is. And my personal belief is that when Muslims say they want to live in a country that has Sharia, what they mean is that they would quite like to buy halal meat, and if they'd like to send their child to a Muslim school, they can, and if, if there could be some Islamic banks, if they choose to give good value, maybe they'd like to take an Islamic mortgage. That, to me, is my understanding of what Muslims mean by Sharia, and I think we need to do some work on that. But I just want to make one uh, sideways, lateral point, which is, um, Ahmed Veresi is completely right that we live in the age of the media, and all we've actually spoken about in terms of content production is news, uh, newspapers and, t and news broadcast. But actually, there's much more content production that goes on, which is highly influential. Um, so things like uh, television programming, radio programming, content that appears on YouTube, um, even things like, and, and again, this comes from my own background, but you wouldn't consider it advertising. It's a huge form of content production and is incredibly influential. Otherwise, brands would not spend as much money as they do on advertising. And thinking about how we integrate into advertising, how we actually shape it or we produce other content, is actually as powerful 
as producing news because that's where popular consciousness and culture comes from. And actually, there's, that's an area that we're really weak. We do have some really good people working in content production. But if you look at Muslim TV, it's really terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I think we can do a lot better even on limited budget so I'd say go away from here and think about all the different kinds of content production that there are and how we can start to influence those Thank you very much um, Let's have the final question in the last five minutes uh, from Zahra Kimji Ooh. Ooh. You mentioned name this time You always mention name <laughs> so got, so yeah. Yes again The media is a key part of the dem democratic process in Britain. Given its power to sway minds, how can more of us here get involved in the media to help try and ensure a fair representation of Muslims? Um, we'll, ha we'll have a discussion about this after the end of the show as well, but um, let's start with the panel. Why me? Um, I don't know how I think Ruhi can answer after this, but I think um, I've seen many Muslims in the media, but. Uh, uh, I don't know uh, if, uh, I mean, they can bring about a change. I don't know. It's a possibility, but um, uh, sometimes uh, because, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, which I will not mention the name. Uh, this person that come to interview me uh, for, for Newsnight, and the Muslim lady tells me, so, you know, the BBC, they always want me to talk you know, uh, about the Muslim issues. And, but even though I was uh, born in Bradford, I don't know anything about the Muslim community, right? And, she, and she's given that responsibility. And so therefore, what she would be doing would be her understanding of the community which she doesn't know, and therefore it would be reflected in the media. And, and how much power, other than if you are in a high position within, like you're an editor or producer or whatever, you might have uh, power to change the way the terminologies are used, or the way it's something uh, um, to ensure that when we uh, are presenting about uh, um, people, and in, in this case about Muslims, you can be objective. I'm not saying there should be no criticism, but should be more objective. I don't know how much influence one can have just because you're a Muslim in the media. It depends in what position you are in. I mean, uh, and I don't think there's any um, any of the channels are owned by any Muslims. I don't know. Ali. Okay, fine. Um, I'm no expert in this. Um, all I would say is. Um, there's a lot more opportunities now than there ever have been in terms of getting your views and your opinions or the content across. And we've, we've discussed the different sorts of the social media as well as the, the usual media outlets. Um, what I would though say is it's all good trying to change perceptions, but you know, if you're not me, you know, we need to generate content as well, right? It's not just about spinning stories, it's about actually making stories. We have to be a bit more proactive, and that's, the, that's probably the harder part, but actually probably the more you know, substantial and the more effective part, you know? It's only very little, they, you know, it, it's, there's only a limited number of ways of spinning, let's say, for example, a food bank in Harrow, right? You can't, you know, you can't say Muslims are poisoning Harrow residents, et cetera, et cetera, no, okay? So let's just think about a bit more proactive things and then hopefully the media stories will follow. Shalina? So your question was how do we get better representation? Um, I think there have been some really good suggestions so far. So making yourself available to the media, um, particularly if you think you've got something to say, um, and actually it's remarkably easy, as Ali has described, to phone up and or write or email an editor or a producer. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we haven't actually mentioned yet, um, which is indirect, is if you see a piece that you like, either in the TV or in print, yeah. write and tell them. Or actually, tweeting is fantastic now because most editors have Twitter feeds and you can tweet them. So it's great because sometimes editors do go out of their way to publish things or producers do produce things which are a little bit off the beaten track and they're taking a risk. And if they get a lot of positive feedback, it makes them look good, um, which means that it's more likely that they're going to do something again. So definitely take five minutes to send an email to somebody that you liked what they did. Um, other things that we haven't spoken about, uh, we talked about lazy journalism. Um, and I think alongside lazy journalism are lazy photo editors. And if you're writing a story about Muslims, and I, um, and I published material um, as well around Muslims, um, it's actually remarkably difficult to find photographs which are not of women in niqabs. 
Um, the images just don't exist. And when you're looking for images, you want something that's telling your reader immediately that this is a story about Muslims. And um, there are actually remarkably few good photos that, that bring that to life. Um, so there was a nice little initiative I've come across in the US. Um, that, so there are photo libraries that you will have heard of, like Getty and Reuters. This is a small Muslim one called um, uh, Salam Stock. And they actually try and develop photos of Muslims doing interesting, non-typical, non-Nikabi, non-depressing, non-terrorist, non-protest pictures. <laughs> um, so again, that's, those are simple, easy things that we can start to do is to kind of produce a resource of images. So I think it's thinking about these little positive things to make people's jobs a bit easier, you know, pitching stories, pitching angles that they might not have thought of. And eventually, you know, I'm, I'm positive, optimistic, even though it seems like the rest of the room is not, um, <laughs> that we can make these small changes and they will have a trickle effect on, on the public perception of Muslims. Thank you very much. I think there's still some views still out in the audience, but we have to stop as our time is up. Um, next week, we're celebrating the Willad of our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. Um, and the lectures by Dr. Ali al-Hilli, um, and that starts before prayers at 8 o'clock, and it finishes at prayers at 8.49. So please come, and you can see our programs at www.sikkim.org.uk and recordings of um, all of our lectures, including this, uh, on www.youtube.co.com forward slash Sikkim TV. Many thanks to the panel, um, particularly thanks to the audience who've come. And from Mafal Ali, until next week, good night. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.